Hi everyone, this is the weekly ASF Science Roundup. This is a very special issue of the weekly podcast because I'm going to be spending the entire time summarizing a meeting we held on Wednesday of this week. This meeting focused on sex and gender differences in ASD. You might remember we sent around a save the date for this meeting, and we were honored to include many women with ASD or mothers of daughters with ASD at this science event. We kind of started planning this meeting while I was at Autism Speaks, but I could not have been more proud that this event was sponsored by ASF, AS, and organized together with the Simons Foundation. So what did we talk about? What were the big questions in the area that we covered? We had mapped them out months ago to make sure the right people were around the table. But in the first presentation, Peter Zatmari, who's a very well-known autism researcher and physician in Canada, succinctly summarized the main issues. They were, one, is there really a four to one ratio of boys versus girls? Two, if so, what's causing these differences? Three, if not, and the ratio isn't four to one, Where are the girls that are not being counted in studies? Four, are there differences in the way boys and girls with ASD look? Do they have different behavioral profiles? Do they, are are the features different? Five, how early do you see the differences if you do see them? And lastly, what are the challenges that girls with ASD face compared to boys or even to girls without ASD? And what happens to girls as they grow up? Okay, let's start with this ratio. This four boys to every one girl ratio is based on the CDC numbers from the Adams study. This is the study that gave us the prevalence of one in 68. Well, here are some reasons why it may actually be less than four to one. First, it isn't always four to one. For example, in high risk studies, it's more like three to one. If it's really four to one, it should be four to one no matter how you're diagnosing people in the study or where they're coming from. But some methods and some data, even within the same study, have different numbers. For example, if you look at that CDC study, those states who had a higher percentages of lower IQ individuals had more girls. So they had lower ratios, anywhere in the maybe three to one range. Finally, if you look at the ratio from people who aren't diagnosed with autism, but do show some autism symptomatology, the ratio is much less than four to one. It's more like two to one. This indicates that this discrepancy between four to one to three to one to maybe two to one may be an issue with how people are diagnosed, not necessarily a really strong four to one number. But no matter how you cut it, there always seems to be more boys than girls who are diagnosed with autism. So let's just assume that the number is two to one or three to one or four to one. There are still more boys with ASD than girls. Why is this? Are boys or males more at risk for autism or is there something that's protecting girls in some way? New gene studies, including one that came out this week, are showing that girls actually have a higher genetic load for autism. They have more of those de novo mutations, meaning they're new and not inherited, and they're mostly copy number variations. So in my mind, and I think for most people, if you think about it, it would kind of mean that with more of a genetic load, they should actually have autism more often, not less often, than boys. This obviously isn't the case. You might remember a study published last year that showed that if you were the twin of a girl with autism, you had higher ASD symptoms even without an autism diagnosis. They aren't, these, these are the people that aren't quite meeting the full threshold for autism, but something is going on in these twins. Researchers concluded that they were protected against some of the symptoms of autism. So they were protected against reaching the full diagnostic threshold. How? Well, is it another gene that contradicts these autism risk genes? Is it the way girls' brains are wired or shaped? Or maybe it's something cultural or something gender specific? It's probably all three or four or five. Instead, the question shouldn't be so much how girls are different than boys with autism, but how they're different from girls without autism. One of the main themes that came away from the discussion is that girls and boys are different. The, the way girls with ASD interact with other girls and way they socialize are different than boys. 
If you wanted to make some generalizations on the girl, on the whole, girls with autism were more likely to have a lower IQ than boys with autism. On the whole, they were also more likely to show lower rates of repetitive behaviors, and but more likely to have those insistence and sameness characteristics. So they want to stick to a routine or keep things the same. As we all know, this may be the general rule, but it's not true in everyone. There are girls with high IQs, and they do show some repetitive behaviors. And also on the whole, they tend to be a little more social. So if we're missing girls because of these differences on the whole, like changes in IQ um, and sociability, should we change the way autism is diagnosed? We tend to look at autism through the eyes of specific ways and procedures that it's, that it's determined, like a parent report and a direct observation. So it may be possible that if girls and boys with autism are not the same, that we should keep the construct of autism the same, but the way that we categorize or even identify symptoms in girls and boys may need to be a little bit different. But before we do any of this, Maybe the first step is that physicians need guidelines on what sorts of behaviors are seen in girls with autism and incorporate some examples of these behaviors into how they diagnose. This was just an idea and not, exact, not something that we're going to be doing tomorrow. Okay, so how early do you see these differences? Well, I can tell you that there are studies underway, um, but no data exists right now. However, the social environment of a toddler is not the same as a preschooler, and it's certainly not the same as an adolescent. Girls have social ch different challenges than boys, and maybe big differences that you see aren't really seen until social pressures are in place. As one person with autism put it, you may not be able to see it in the clinic, but watch us at a cocktail party and then see what you think. We ended up calling this the cocktail party test throughout the day. As autism is a disorder that originates before birth, clearly autism is there, but it just may be hard to see the obvious differences in girls and boys with ASD in very early life. They may be subtle, but we really don't have any data on this yet. Now on to the next topic. I found this one to be the most sobering, but I also know it's incredibly necessary to talk about. Girls with autism who may be underdiagnosed and probably misunderstood deal with different societal pressures than boys with autism do. These different pressures are often not understood, sometimes simply due to the fact that there are so many fewer girls with autism in research studies. When these girls with ASD grow up to be women, what happens to them? Julie Taylor presented some published data that suggested that women with autism do get jobs and do go to pursue education beyond high school. However, they don't stay in one very place for very long. Sometimes they flounder between jobs and stretches of unemployment or drop in and out of post-secondary education programs. We talked a lot about why this may be happening. Parents may be concerned about the safety of their daughters and therefore may be allowing or encouraging them to take breaks between stints with jobs or education programs. Women with autism struggle when placed into male-dominated careers. This challenge may have more to do with the way women are treated in the workplace than how people with autism are treated in the workplace. At the workshop, one woman with autism mentioned that she had trouble maintaining a job because the expectations of her employer as a girl didn't meet her abilities. We're really thankful that Julie is studying this topic because clearly we need more data on this subject. So one last point here. There are many reasons why Autism Science Foundation invested in a meeting like this. First, girls with autism are poorly understood and under-researched. That's a fact. Fewer girls than boys are recruited and researched, and so no one should be surprised that we don't understand them as well. One researcher called them the orphans of autism research. Fortunately, there are some new projects like one at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health and one at Yale that focuses exclusively on girls with autism, but we still need to do better. Our girls and our families deserve it. Additionally, studying girls with autism has enormous translational impact. It can lead to real-life solutions not just for girls, but for other people with autism. Girls are not the only orphan group. Racial and ethnic disparities often stand in the way of Hispanic and African-American individuals receiving an autism diagnosis that could, get, that could help them get the services they need. They, too, are orphans. What we learn about girls can impact the way we see other groups with autism. Knowing the needs of girls is going to improve treatment for them as well. And finally, 
If we know about this protective effect and what we believe girls to have, it might lead to specific mechanisms to treat and prevent autism in other groups. That was actually somewhat of the more exciting prospects discussed at the meeting. Before I wrap up, I want to say something really, really important. On Sunday, we'll be falling back one hour in time. No, that's not what was important. But when you fall back this weekend, give back. This gathering of researchers on the important topic of sex and gender differences and the research that will come out of this discussion is not possible without your support of the Autism Science Foundation. Please visit www.autismsciencefoundation.org to support ASF. Take the extra hour you're going to gain and donate to science through ASF. Thanks again for listening this week. I'm so glad I got to share with you some of these messages that were discussed at this meeting. I'll catch up with you next week and we'll discuss the latest in autism science. Talk to you then and happy Halloween.